Uh, good morning. Good morning. Yes. One person is alive, or at least paying attention. I think you're all alive. Welcome to Fayette Baptist Church. Whether you're here in person or via internet, speaking of in person, our oldest member is in the house today. If you don't know who that is, that's Lorraine Cretion. God bless you, dear, for being with us today. Just to give you a little heads up, communion will be today, first Sunday of May. So if you're watching by internet, prepare yourself for that. It'll be at the end of the sermon time. So let's open with prayer to our Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you that we are here today to worship you in spirit and in truth. We come before you humbly, King of kings and Lord of lords, with the reverent fear of a child and due respect of all that you are. Let our words, our song, of fellowship be pleasing in your sight first and foremost and bring you the glory that is due your name, Heavenly Father, in the Son's name, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who made a way where there was no way for us to have this very communion with you. He is our righteousness. And forever we are grateful for that. Jesus, amen. We have a new song that we'd like to teach you guys this morning. Um, you may have heard it on the radio. It's been out for a little while. It's called King of Kings. Um, so I, I love the song. I really do. Um, what I love about this song is that all the verses, they kind of tell a story. And, it, and it, the first verse is about where we were without Christ. You know, we were hopeless. And then it tells us what he's done for us. It helps us to remember what he's done for us. And then it, the last verse, verse 4, it shows us our, our hope and the future that we have and the hope that we have in Christ now. Now things have changed so much. And then the chorus, the nice simple chorus, and it's just responding in, to the Father in praise for what he's done. Um, the chorus says, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of Kings. So before we do it, um, let's go ahead and go through that chorus a couple of times and once you guys catch on, feel free to jump right in, and then we'll, we'll go through the whole song. Go for it.
Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from the tombs, and the angels stood in.
Psalm 86, 8 through 10, says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Wonderful in all your ways. You are the one and only true God. You're above everyone and everything. God, we worship you. We adore you. We thank you, God, for all that you are, for all that you've done for us, for all that you're going to do, God, the hope that lies within us. You are great. You are amazing. Amen. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation's
Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. What a gift it is to be able to gather together like this. Uh, my heart is, is filled with joy this morning just seeing uh, familiar faces that, you know, we haven't seen for so long. Faces that we love. These, these are our brothers and sisters, and, and uh, we just don't want to take them for granted. And uh, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be a part of your family. And we recognize that you paid a great price to make that possible, and we love you for that. And we commit our lives to you, and tonight, today, in this time, we commit our hearts and our minds to you as we open your word. And uh, God, just help us to understand you better and to, and to take away the truths of this, of this passage that we're looking at this morning and apply it to our lives. Pray that you would minister to each and every one of us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to begin this morning by asking you a question that 
more than likely you've probably already been asked a number of times this morning. So, you ready? How are you? How are you doing? Now, if you're anything like me, you've probably, uh, when you were asked that question, you probably went into autopilot, right? And you probably answered that question with a, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for asking, right? And we do this little dance and we shake hands or well, we give an elbow or something. And then we smile and we move on to the next person and we say, good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for asking. And we just go through this process, right? But the truth is, a lot of times we say we're good when we're not good. We put on a smile and we pretend that we're okay but the reality is our hearts are deeply troubled. When I, was, um, when I was a young boy growing up in the church, you know, where I grew up, we used to sing a, a song in, in, in uh, children's church called Happy All the Time. How many people know? Does anybody know the song? Hey, that's not bad. There's a bunch of you. Where are you going to learn it? It's going to be the new theme song. Yeah, we're going to sing it every day. So let me teach it to you. The words go like this. I'm in right, out right, upright, downright, happy all the time. I'm in right, out right, upright, downright, happy all the time. Since Jesus Christ came in and cleansed my heart from sin. Ready? And this is the way we do it in, in Sunday school in children's church. You get faster and faster and faster as you go through it. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. Yeah, right? And we would do that over and over and over again. We'd sing it faster and faster and faster. And it was a fun song to sing. The problem is, it wasn't true. <laughs> it's not true. I am not happy all the time. And neither are you. As Christians, I think sometimes we carry an unnecessary burden of thinking that we must pretend to be happy even when we're hurting. Brothers and sisters, we need to accept the fact that we are not immune from pain. We're not immune from sadness and, and from grief. Jesus experienced pain. Jesus experienced sadness and grief. In Isaiah 53, verse 3, we're told that the Messiah, Jesus, would be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We know uh, from reading John's gospel that Jesus wept, wept as he grieved with Mary and, and Martha uh, over the death of their brother Lazarus in John chapter 11. None of us, none of us are immune from pain, sadness, and grief. And so the question is, what do we do, what do we do when our hearts are troubled? Is there any hope for troubled hearts? Somebody answer the question. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, there is hope for troubled hearts. If you have your Bible with you, uh, turn with me to Psalm chapter 77. Psalm 77 uh, was written by a man named Asaph, and Asaph was a worship leader who was appointed by King David. You can read about that in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, and he was appointed to lead worship in the tabernacle. Actually, Asaph wrote uh, 12 of the Psalms that we have in our, in our Bible. Uh, he wrote Psalm 50, and then he wrote Psalms 73 through 83. Uh, and this psalm, uh, Psalm 77, was written by Asaph and given to Jeduthun, who was one of David's chief musicians. As we work our way through this psalm this morning, we're going to see that this worship leader, Asaph, is walking through a season of deep, deep anguish. And we're going to see how Asaph was able to find hope in the midst 
of his troubles. Let's begin reading uh, in verse in verse one. Psalm 77, to the choir master, according to Jedithan, a psalm of Asaph. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Say la. Can you feel? Can you feel the weight of the burden that Asaph is carrying? His heart is weighed down and he's crying out to God for help. Now it's interesting in this psalm that Asaph never says what the burden is that has him troubled. He doesn't identify the source of his pain. Was it something personal that was going on in his life? Maybe. Maybe it was a burden that he was carrying for his people, for the nation of Israel. The text doesn't say what the trouble is. But whatever it is, it has clearly impacted Asaph both personally and deeply. You know, I'm kind of glad that the text doesn't say what it was that was troubling him. Because if it did, if he told us what it was that was troubling him, then we would be tempted to compare our troubles to his to see if our reaction is appropriate, right? Instead of just accepting the fact that for a variety of reasons, we all face times in our lives when we can relate to the pain and the sorrow that Asaph is expressing so freely here in this psalm. There are a million reasons why we might find ourselves deep in sorrow. But take note of this. When Asaph's heart was troubled, what did he do? He sought comfort from the Lord. Asaph's first response is prayer. He brings his troubles to God. You know, sadly, for many of us, prayer is often treated as a last resort instead of a first response. When we've done everything else, guess all we can do now is pray, right? And when we do go to God in prayer, we often give up quickly, right? When things don't change and and things don't happen the way that we want them to or expect them to, when God doesn't answer the prayers the way we'd like, we give up. But Asaph, however, demonstrates a persistence here in his prayer. In verse 1, he says, I cry aloud to God. Aloud to God. He says it twice for emphasis. In verse 2, he says, In the night... My hand is stretched out without wearying. Have you ever found yourself in that place of grief where you're reaching out to God? You're crying out, God, please answer me. God, please help me, right? My heart is so heavy. My soul feels crushed. This is not some half-hearted request from Asaph, some silent prayer just tossed up in a few seconds before drifting off to sleep, right? No, this is the desperate, unrelenting cry of a man who is in deep, deep sorrow. In verse 2, he says, my soul refuses to be comforted. Have you ever felt that way? Or or maybe walked alongside somebody who is feeling that type of soul-crushing sorrow. It reminds me of Jacob in the book of Genesis. When he thought that his son Joseph had been killed, the Bible says that his other sons and daughters tried to comfort him. But in Genesis 37, 35, we read that he refused to be comforted. Have you ever been there? 
Have you ever been in a place where the pain is so strong that your heart and soul refuses to be comforted? You know, maybe, maybe you're there right now. Maybe this is one of those seasons in your life. My prayer for you this morning is that this psalm of Asaph will lead you to find hope in the midst of those troubles. In verse 3, Asaph helps us to further understand just the depth of his sorrow. He says, when I remember God, I moan. That's not, the, that's not the response you expect from the worship leader, right? It's not the, the response that we're, we're accustomed to. Usually when we think of God, that brings us comfort, right? But Asaph says, when I think of God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Man, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for the emotional honesty that Asaph displays here. We're not used to that type of emotional honesty, are we? How are you? I'm good. Fine. How are you? Good. Right? Asaph is crying out to God. He's pouring out his heart, reaching to God for help, but the situation isn't changing. His troubles still remain. And he knows, he knows that God is listening, right? Verse 1, he said, I know he hears me. He knows God is listening. He knows that God is aware of all this inner turmoil. And the knowledge of that, knowing that God is listening and the situation isn't changing, only magnifies his grief. Please tell me I'm not the only one who has felt that way before. God, I know you hear me. I know you see me. You see the pain. Why don't you do something? That's what he's saying, right? Brothers and sisters, these are the faith-stretching moments of your journey with Christ. Will we continue to cling to God even when our situation doesn't change? Will we continue to cling to God even when it hurts to just think of him? Charles Spurgeon uh, in his commentary on, on this psalm, talked about how he, Charles Spurgeon, could identify with Asaph's pain. He said, Alas, my God, the writer of this exposition well knows what thy servant Asaph meant, for his soul is familiar with the way of grief. Deep glens and lonely caves of soul depressions my soul knows full well your awful glooms. That's Charles Spurgeon. This is the man who is fondly referred to as the Prince of Preachers. Brothers and sisters, if you have found yourself weighed down with grief and crying out to God, you need to know that you are not alone. You're not alone. And I encourage you not to walk through that pain alone. You have brothers and sisters that God has supplied to you to walk through those troubles with you. Amen. And there is hope. Hope that Asaph is going to discover in this psalm. At the end of verse 3, you see that Asaph includes the word Selah. Most interpreters believe that this is an instruction for the musician to pause and to reflect on what was just read or what was just sung to pause and just allow the weight of it to sink in. Can you relate to Asaph's struggle? Several years ago, there was a, uh, there's a band called 10th Avenue North, and uh, they released a song called Warn, W-O-R-N. Coincidentally, it's a song that some radio stations, Christian radio stations, refuse to play because it didn't resolve. Because it didn't end with, and now I'm happy, happy, happy all the time. Right? And so they wouldn't play it. But this song, like a modern day psalm of lament, is a cry out to God in the midst of the troubles of life. I've asked my wife, who's here, right, right here. I've asked my wife if she would come and, and, and sing that song for us this morning. 
And as she does, just see if you can relate to this cry out for help. Thank you, Jen. Well, it's a heavy song. And I can't tell you how many times that I've turned to that song and prayed those lyrics in my own life. Or I've thought about those lyrics as I've walked with others through their grief. Let me know redemption wins. Let me know that this struggle ends 
and that you can mend a heart that is frail and torn. I want to know that a song can rise from the ashes of a broken life and all this dead inside can be reborn because I am worn. It's heavy. But we felt it, haven't we? We've been there. Well, in verse 4, after the first of three Selahs in this song, Asaph is going to continue his lament. Verse 4, he says, You, God, you hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. Have you ever been so troubled that you're not even able to find comfort in sleep? I can recall nights in my own life during times of, you know, either emotional, physical, spiritual, relational, you name it, troubles, where I have begged God to either help me to fall asleep, God, please just help me to fall asleep, or at least, at least allow morning to come to distract me from my pain. Have you been there? Asaph says, I can't even sleep. And God, you're the one that's holding my eyelids open. Talk about frustrated. I'm so troubled I cannot speak, he says. As Asaph struggles to find rest, he runs out of words to say. He is, he is worn, right? In verse 5, he says, I consider the days of old, the years of Long ago, lying there, unable to sleep, Asaph begins to reflect back on better days. And in verse 6, he says, I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. You know, you really do have to appreciate Asaph's tenacity, right? He's not giving up. In the midst of his pain, he continues to cry out to God. Asaph asks the Lord to help him remember the songs that he used to sing in the night. You have any favorite songs that you cry out to God? Asaph, the worship leader, no doubt had favorite psalms that he liked to sing. God, help me to remember those songs which used to bring me joy and comfort. God, let me meditate in my heart, he cried. Help me to meditate on these things. God, help me to understand. And then he says, then my spirit made a diligent search. Lying there in his bed, weighed down with troubles, unable to sleep, Asaph begins to diligently search his heart, to meditate on God. And to remember. And this diligent search leads Asaph to voice his deepest fears. And he does so in the form of, of, of a series of questions. Let's look at verses 7 through 9. Verses 7 through 9. <clears throat> he says, Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Say la. Asaph vocalizes his deepest fears. Are these circumstances going to last forever. I mean, when you're in that place of deep, deep sorrow, is there anything worse than thinking it's always going to be this way? Is this the new norm that I'm going to live, Lord? Am I personally, are, are we as a nation going to be rejected forever? Are you never going to show us favor again? God, has your love run out? Are the promises through? 
God, please tell me you have not forgotten how to be gracious, have you? Are you so angry, God, that you refuse to be compassionate any longer? <sighs> Say la. The pain is so thick, right? But aren't you glad that Asaph had the honesty to voice the depth of his fears? Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that you can voice your concerns to God. You can, you can have the same honest relationship with God that Asaph has. You can tell him your fears. You can ask him the questions that are plaguing your soul. Again, in, in Spurgeon's commentary on this psalm, he said, he said the questions that, that Asaph is asking are suggested by fear. But they are also the cure of fear. It's a blessed thing. It's a blessed thing to have grace enough to look such questions in the face. Not to suppress them, right? To look those questions in the face. For their answer is self-evident and eminently fitted to cheer the heart. Each one of the questions is a dart aimed at the very heart of despair. Spurgeon says that the answers to Asaph's questions will actually provide the hope that is necessary to minister to his heart. Why? Because the answers to the questions will, will, will affirm Asaph that, that God hasn't changed. He realizes that God is gracious, has been gracious, will always be gracious. He is loving. He is compassionate. As Asaph vocalizes his questions and begins to contemplate their answers, a major, major shift begins to take place in this psalm. A major shift begins to take place in Asaph's outlook. Verse 10. Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. In verse 10, Asaph makes a decision. He draws a line in the sand. He is going to appeal to the years of the right hand of the Most High. And the idea of the right hand of the Most High is a way of describing God's power and strength. Asaph is making a decision that he is going to focus on God's power and his strength as it has been displayed in years past. And then in verses 11 and 12, he says this, I will remember the days of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. As Asaph considers the, the, the answers to his questions, he determines himself to cling to what he knows to be true about God. He makes the choice to focus on all that God has done in the past. Brothers and sisters, in this pivotal section of Psalm 77, we find the key to unlocking hope for troubled hearts. Hope is found in shifting our focus off our troubles and onto our God. Amen? Amen? Hope is found in shifting our focus off our troubles and onto our God. You see, in the first nine verses of this psalm, Asaph, he has been crying out to God, right? With, with persistence even. But his eyes have been focused on his troubles, right? But beginning now in verse 10, Asaph takes his eyes off his troubles and focuses them on his God. And he does so by choosing to remember. By choosing to remember. He says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work. I will meditate on your mighty deeds. Asaph chooses to remember 
all that God has done. You know, that's why it's so important. It's so important for us to study God's word. We need to know of his mighty deeds in the past. We need to know God's character, right? We need to understand his promises. So when those questions like Asaph has comes into our minds, we know the answers to those questions, don't we? Because we remember what we have read in his word. You know, when we read the Old Testament, we see that God commanded his people to remember, didn't he? A few weeks ago, we celebrated a Passover Seder service here together. A celebration that in Exodus chapter 13, the Jews were commanded to observe every year. It was a way for them to remember how God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. He didn't want them to forget, right? In 1 Samuel chapter 7, after God had delivered his people from the hands of the Philistines, Samuel set up a stone and he called it, anyone? What did he call that stone? Ebenezer, not Scrooge, no. He named it, he called that stone Ebenezer. You guys sing that song, right? Here I raise my Ebenezer in the hymn. We sing it, we don't even know, we think it's Scrooge. Here I raise my Scrooge. We used to have a donkey next door called Ebenezer. <laughs> Wasn't the donkey either. No, Ebenezer, he named it Ebenezer, which means a stone of help. Whenever Jews would see this stone, they would remember how God delivered them. It is so important for us to remember what God has done. We need to know what he's done in the past. We need to know what he's done in scripture. We need to know what he's done in the lives of other people around us. And we need to remember what he's done in our own personal walks with him. Amen? We need to remember. When our family was living in New York, we, uh, we learned about a, a missionary family who had a bowl, a big bowl that they kept uh, on their coffee table. And whenever they experienced God's blessings or, or provision in their life, they would pick up a stone, you know, out in the driveway in the yard. They'd grab a stone and they would take a, a, a Sharpie and they would just write a brief description on that stone uh, about how God had, had come through, how God had blessed them or provided for them. And then they would put that stone in the bowl on the coffee table. Then, whenever they found themselves in a time of trouble, when they were going through some circumstance where they didn't know how God was going to pull through for them, they would take the bowl and they would dump out the whole bowl onto the coffee table. And then together, they would pick up the stones and they began reading them one by one and placing them back into the bowl. They took time to remember God's faithfulness in the past in order to provide comfort in the present and a confident hope for the future. Now, I think it's a brilliant idea. I've always thought it was a brilliant idea, but I'm just too lazy. I don't know. I, I haven't done it. But whether you choose to put stones in a bowl or whether you choose to keep a, a journal or whether you choose to rely on your memory, <laughs> let me know how that works. You'll forget to let me know. We need to remember because choosing to remember is vital to our faith. When we remind ourselves of God's character and God's faithfulness in the past, we receive comfort in the present and we receive hope for the future. Well, in verse 13, Asaph continues. He says, your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You're the God who works wonders. You have made known your mighty deeds among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. Say la. Can you feel? Can you feel the change that's taking place in the psalm? Can you feel the shift in perspective as he chooses to remember? I mean, if you just look at the previous two say la's, 
right? They were like heavy sighs of grief. Selah, right? But this Selah is a timely pause to breathe in the hope that is found in a mighty and holy God. Selah, right? Things are changing. And so now, beginning in verse 16, Asaph is going to provide a specific and a powerful example of how God has rescued his people in the past. In beautiful, poetic detail, Asaph recalls the way that God parted the Red Sea and saved his people as they fled from the Egyptians during the Exodus. Verse 16, he says, When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. What an image, right? As God is leading his people out of Egypt and they approach the shores of the Red Sea, Asa says that the waters begin to tremble at the presence of God. It reminds me, it reminds me of the time when, when Jesus was sleeping in the boat. You know, like that story? Jesus is asleep in the boat, and there's a violent storm that kicks up on the Sea of Galilee, right? And the disciples, they are freaking out, right? We're going to die. It's all over. And so they go, and they wake up. Jesus, Jesus, don't you even care? And in Matthew chapter 8, we're told that he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and the sea obey him? I'll tell you what sort of man this is. It's the son of man, God the son, who has the power over all of creation. <laughs> Asaph continues in verse 17. He says, the clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world, and the earth trembled and shook. Now, if you're familiar with the Exodus story, as probably most of you are, you might be thinking, wait a minute. I've read Exodus 14 many, many times. And there is no mention of thunder. There's no mention of lightning. There's no mention about the earth shaking or whirlwinds and rain as the, as the Israelites crossed over the Red Sea. And if you're thinking that, you would be correct. You are correct. In Exodus chapter 14, there is no mention of these elements. So the question is, is Asaph just adding poetic flair here? Is he dis or, uh, or, or is he describing the event in the way that it had been passed down through the generations to him? I mean, does the absence of these details in Exodus 14, the fact that they aren't listed in Exodus 14, does that mean that there was no thunder and lightning? Or is Asaph providing a description adding further color to one of the most significant events in Israel's history? You want to know the answer, right? The answer is, I don't know. Because I wasn't there. Um, so I can't, I don't know. I don't know. Was, was there thunder and lightning? I can tell you this. I have no trouble whatsoever imagining it just as Asaph describes it. This was a moment of incredible judgment as God poured out wrath on the Egyptians pursuing his people as they fled, crossing over the Red Sea. Jewish historian Josephus, in his account of Israel's history, describes the Red Sea crossing in a similar fashion to Asaph. He writes... As soon as ever the whole Egyptian army was within it, the sea flowed to its own place and came down with a torrent 
raised by storms of wind and encompassed the Egyptians. Showers of rain also came down from the sky and dreadful thunders and lightning with flashes of fire. Thunderbolts also were darted upon them. Nor, listen, nor was there anything which used to be sent by God upon men as indications of his wrath, which did not happen at this time. For a dark and dismal might oppressed them. And thus did all these men perish, so that there was not one man left to be a messenger of this calamity to the rest of the Egyptians. Wow. Well, verse 19, Asaph says, Your way, your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. I just love the imagery that Asaph paints here. God led his people through the sea, but look at that, yet his footprints were unseen. You know, how encouraging it is, it is for us to know that God goes before his people. God is the one who makes a way when there is no way. And just because we feel like we are surrounded by troubles and there doesn't seem to be any end in sight doesn't mean that God isn't working on our behalf. Just because you don't see his footprints doesn't mean he's not there. Just because we can't see him with our eyes doesn't mean he's not walking right there beside us. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. And then in verse 20, Asaph concludes this psalm. It's kind of rather abrupt by saying, You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Last week, <clears throat> Pastor Dan reminded us of God's shepherd heart as he taught through the familiar words of Psalm 23. Asaph concludes his psalm with a reminder that God is our shepherd. He's leading his people. He's leading his people in both miraculous ways, like the parting of the Red Sea, and he's leading his people through under shepherds like Moses and Aaron. He leads in both ways, doesn't he? In John chapter 10, we're told that Jesus, Jesus is the good shepherd, the one that lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. These are the things that we need to remember when we're walking through times of great trouble. We need to remember that we are not alone. God loves you. Jesus died for you. If you're his child, if you're one of his sheep, he is with you as you journey through the deepest troubles of this life. And if he is not if he's not your Savior, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord, your Savior, he invites you to come to him, receive forgiveness of your sins, and to become one of his sheep. It's an invitation. It's available to you. Are you, are you going to you know, stubbornly refuse this offer, or are you going to come to him and receive him? And with it, all the blessings that come with knowing Jesus... Oh, man, the hope that's available for those who are his. Asaph found hope when he shifted his focus off his troubles and onto his God. I want you to notice, again, it, it, the psalm ends so abruptly. The text does not say that his circumstances changed, does it? It doesn't say, and then I saw redemption win. Then I saw the struggle end, right? It doesn't say that. 
The circumstances, by all, all, all indications, didn't change. But Asaph was changed. Asaph was changed as he rediscovered hope. When I was in Bible college, I had a pastor who used to say, it is not how hard the pressure is, but where the pressure lies. It's not how hard the pressure is, but where the pressure lies. And he explained that when we allow the pressures and the troubles of life to stand between us and God, then the larger the pressure, the larger the troubles, the harder it becomes for us to see God, right? But when we allow the pressures and the troubles of life to push us to God, then the larger the pressures and the troubles are, the faster we fall to our knees in front of the one and only person who is able to walk with us and bring us hope and comfort in the midst of those troubles. It is not a matter of how hard the pressure is, but where the pressure lies. And the, the key to that quote is, you get to decide, am I going to allow this trouble to stand between me and God or push me to him? You decide. Because hope is found in shifting our focus off the troubles and onto our God. Amen? Amen. So, let's make the decision. Let's make the decision to do what Asaph did in his troubles. Remember the deeds of the Lord. Remember his wonders of old. Ponder all his works and meditate on his mighty deeds. Let's close our time together. Uh, I'm going to have Al come up and, uh, and the worship team. And uh, they're going to lead us in a time of remembrance as we take communion. A time that, that Jesus commanded that we, that we do, right? To, to, to take time and remember what he did for us. And again, I just want to say to those who are here, if you're walking through a time of deep hurt and trouble right now in your life, you, gotta, you, gotta, you are not alone. You are not alone. Charles Spurgeon went through it. Moses went through it. David went through it. Asaph went through it. Jesus went through it. I've been through it. We're all doing this, right? Life is hard, but you're not alone. Let's walk together through the troubles of life, and let's keep remembering what God has done in the past, and let's be comforted in the present and receive hope for the future. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, have we had church today or what? <laughs> so, um, he just went through a list of people who have gone through that problems, uh, those problems. Uh, and and uh, it's kind of interesting because he didn't, he didn't steal my, my opening uh, today because uh, I, I called Chris this week just to talk about the service and the flow and communion and how everything was going to work. And, and we did the dance. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Then I, and I, I knew he was coming back off of COVID. So how you, are you guys feeling all right? You cover, recovering? And, you know, we went into it. Yeah, still kind of tired, run down, you know, kind of hurting. He said, how are you? Uh, I said, not very good. Not very good, to be honest with you. And you, you know the spirit of the Lord is in a person when, uh, when he can just give you the right word. And, and we're talking for a few minutes. And he, can tell, he said, Al, I sense you're grieving. And I said, you're right. You're absolutely right. And, and, and that just that one word helped me shift my focus to remember the things that we're talking about. And what a perfect time to have communion, as he just indicated. A time to remember what Christ has done. I don't have a lot to say, but I've got a few comments that I, I just wanted, a few notes that I want to jot, jot down. And I'm just speaking from my heart today, so um, I hope that uh, it will reach you as well. You know, a couple of comments I took from the, from the sermon, you know, I cried out to God for, for help. Uh, when I was in distress, this is what Asaph was saying, when I was in distress, I sought the Lord. And then the third point that I got of it, and, and what he just pointed out is, I remembered you. And that's what communion's all about. You know, when we're struggling, we need to seek the Lord. When our sorrows turn to a desperate plea, 
we need to remember what God has done. The psalmist remembered all of God's mighty works, and what's interesting, and Chris pointed this out to me, and I read through it a little bit later after we visited our, uh, ended our call earlier this week, is that, you know, Asaph doesn't cover, doesn't, doesn't resolve everything in 77. But if you read in, 70, in, in Psalm 78, he goes through all the miraculous deeds that the Lord did for the people of Israel. And, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's an impressive list. And when we realize that, that as Christians, we are the benefactors of God's greatest gift, his son Jesus. Okay? John 3.16, we, we know it well. God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. That's the gift that we have. That's the prize that's the hope that, that we have uh, as believers in Christ. Jesus was the perfect lamb, and he was God's gift to you and me uh, to, and to all who believe. Jesus was the perfect lamb, and, and some face uh, will recount who takes away the sins of the world. Okay? Um, he was the atonement for all the sins of humanity. To those who believe in him, he's the restoration of of relationship with God. He's fellowship that we desire to have. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus, on, on the night that he was betrayed, <clears throat> he was in anguish. He was suffering. He exemplified what we should do in our times of trouble and, and seek communion with God. Jesus did so in prayer. He did so in prayer so much that his sweat turned into blood as he was praying in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember him and the price he's paid so that you and I can have fellowship to him, with him. We heard some great music today, and we're going to hear some more before we end, but, uh, uh, you know... Uh, Chris nailed it on the head today in, in many regards, but how often do you have a song running through your head? Okay, well, I've, had, I've had a few, and, and one of the songs that's been running through my head oh, for, a little, little, for a period of time, and it's not a spiritual song, uh, but it was an iconic song back in the 1970s. Most of you probably recognize it. It's called A Bridge Over Troubled Waters. Okay? It's a beautiful, beautiful song. I don't even know the lyrics, so I'm not going to say that it's a spiritual song or anything like that, but just, just, just stay with the... Stay with the, 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 the name of the song, Bridge Over Troubled Water. And you know, it's a beautiful song. It's a, it's a song that's written in a minor key. It's got a very, very mellow, very soulful uh, sound to it. And I believe there's, there, that, that that's the exact representation because Jesus is our bridge over troubled waters. And when we are in those times and we're looking for those, those opportunities, we need to find that bridge. You know, and in Matthew, the word says that, you know, the, 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 the gate is narrow and few find it. We have been blessed with the knowledge to be able to find that bridge. And we need to take that bridge when we, when we get it. I'm just going to recount to you and we'll, we'll get going. But uh, just the, uh, the recount of the Last Supper uh, in, 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 um, in the Gospel of Luke. I think it's just a beautiful piece and I'll read through some of it here. <clears throat> then on the day of unleavened bread, which, on, on which the Passover lamb had been sacrificed, again, so how symbolic is that, that, that we begin the celebration of communion on the day of Passover when all of the children of God were remembering what God has do had done uh, you know, for the Israelites. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. And then they, they ask, where do, we, where do you want us to prepare it, they asked. And, and he replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner, first of all, that's kind of creepy, isn't it? You just find somebody in town and you're just going to follow him to their house. All right. That's a, it's a, it's a little weird, but, but uh, anyways, the, the teacher asks, where is the guest room and uh, where, my, where my Passover, uh, where I can have Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room, upper room, all furnished, and make preparations there. They left, and, and this is cool, they found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared for the Passover dinner. The hour had come, 
And Jesus and his apostles were reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus eagerly desires to have this communion with us. And, and you know, before I suffer. He knew that was coming. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again. And, and there, these words kind of jumped out at me. Until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And I've got, I'm, I'm not, not that smart, but I've got a good study Bible. It help me out a little bit on that. I looked at those words. Until it finds fulfillment. It says, Jesus earned, yearned to keep that Passover with his disciples because it was the last occasion before he himself was to be slain as the perfect Passover lamb and thus fulfill the sacrifice for all time. Jesus would eat no more Passovers until <clears throat> the coming of the future kingdom. After this, he will renew fellowship with those who through the ages have commemorated the Lord's Supper. That's all of us. Finally, the fellowship will be consummated in, uh, in the great messianic wedding supper to come. And that reference is in Revelation. So we go from Genesis to Revelations. And God wants to have communion with us. So back in Luke, um, he says, and we can prepare... He says, he took the bread and he gave thanks and, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you and praise you that this is the, your body. It represents everything that you went through for us that was broken and, and, uh, and crucified for us, Lord, for us to have eternal salvation relationship with you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand, so, so Lord, we thank you that this represents your body or your blood, the new covenant that gives us relationship. That blood was, was, was spilled for our salvation in Jesus' name. Then he went on to warn uh, the disciples that uh, the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me and, and uh, is at my table. So um, we have to know, and, and uh, Paul gives us the warning in 1 Corinthians that, that we need to make sure that we examine ourselves and that we... Um, the betrayer of the perfect lamb was in his presence. And that is a warning to us that we always need to be on top of where we're at and making ourselves right with the Lord. So with that, let's just pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you that uh, you are the perfect lamb and that uh, you suffered for us. And Lord, you uh, suffered through anguish, but you provided, you provided that way of escape Lord, that bridge over troubled waters, Lord, that we can, that we can, uh, that we can run to, Lord. I pray that you're a, a great God, that you can handle our anguish, that you can handle our suffering and our disappointment, and that you're uh, more than capable. And, and as, as we've heard today, Lord, just remember how many times that you've done that in our lives and be grateful for it. And with that, Lord, we give you all the thanks and praise, honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing that new song again. A song of remembrance. How good it is to remember. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt we praise the father praise the son 
last stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in. how good it is to remember. Thank you so much, Lord, that when we are in those times where we're grieving, where we're tired, we're worn out, and God, we just don't even know if we can go on. We can look to you. We can remember what you've done for us. We can remember where we were, where we are now, and where we're going. God, we're so grateful and so thankful and that hope carries us on. We love you, God, and we thank you and praise your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week.